Well, I'm going to start off by uh, apologizing for uh, Matteo Pellegrini, who can't be here, but um, I hope you're all sympathetic because he's actually lying on the floor in great pain. <laughs> so uh, I'm here to tell you about the work that we've been doing using next generation uh, uh, sequencing on the Illumina platform to understand something about the biology of uh, Chlamydomonas. Now, uh, those of you who were here yesterday already heard about uh, Chlamydomonas and its use as a, a reference organism for understanding metabolism, especially, say, lipid and oil production in, uh, in algae. But it, uh, let's see, it belongs in uh, the plant lineage, specifically in the green plant lineage. And so, although it is a billion years of evolution away, from the streptophyte and the land plants, yet at the same time, its uh, chloroplast, which you can see here as electron-dense material, is in fact very highly conserved, especially the photosynthetic apparatus. And one can consider it to be essentially identical to that in, um, uh, in land plants. So much of what we know about oxygen-evolving photosynthesis in the plastid, in fact, has come from studies in uh, Chlamydomonas. The JGI has uh, several genome sequencing projects in uh, algae, so of course it's a, uh, in fact it is a very valuable reference organism for uh, the algae such as uh, Dunaliella and the chlorella species that uh, have recently been completed. So the methods that we're developing here for Chlamydomonas we hope can be applied in fact for the analysis of other algal genomes as well. However, it is also a model organism in the sense that it gives us, the experimentalists, uh, many opportunities for uh, studying pathways of interest because it displays extraordinary metabolic diversity. So I've already mentioned that it's uh, a useful organism for studying photosynthesis because it can grow phototrophically, meaning on CO2 and uh, light, and that process is uh, plastid uh, dependent. It can grow in the dark on acetate as a source of reduced carbon, uh, independent of uh, photosynthetic function, and that of course is a uh, mitochondrial dependent uh, respiratory pathway so they can grow heterotrophically. So this means that it's possible of course to use classical genetic approaches to study photosynthesis because we can maintain the organism. Uh, more recently, um, Groups uh, uh, have been interested in studying the pathway of hydrogen production, which is basically an electron dumping pathway uh, where the cells reduce protons to hydrogen. And this occurs when photosystem two or the oxygen evolving complex is uh, uh, degraded in a situation of low sulfur nutrition. Uh, even more recently, several groups now are interested in metabolism in Chlamydomonas under low nitrogen conditions because in that situation where presumably because the nitrogen is limiting for amino acid biosynthesis, uh, the cells put their fixed carbon into uh, molecules such as lipids. So there's upregulation of lipid production pathways under low nitrogen. So it provides a nice repertoire of uh, metabolism for uh, the experimental biologist. Uh, it's also got uh, tremendous value because of the different approaches we can use in the lab, including classical genetics because the organism displays heterothallic mating types. That is, we can do sexual crosses and take advantage of uh, 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 classical genetic uh, studies. We can grow the cells in the lab in large volume, many, many liters. So this means that we can purify proteins and do conventional biochemistry. And of course, as you can see here from these pictures, it is in the end a microbe, so we can take advantage of uh, classical microbiology as well. My own group is interested in mineral nutrition, and you heard from Ginger Armbrust's talk uh, earlier today about the importance of uh, mineral nu uh, nutrients in uh, primary productivity in the oceans. And here is an example in my lab where we've depleted uh, the, um, the nutrient, the medium of Chlamydomonas to generate various types of micronutrient uh, deficiencies. What I'm going to uh, talk to you about is our use of uh, the version 3 uh, draft genome. Just a couple of weeks ago, version 4 was public re publicly released, but uh, we haven't uh, used that yet. There are about 15,000 uh, gene models, and about half of these are supported by uh, mRNA and EST evidence. Okay. So what I'm going to do is uh, use our project on uh, copper metabolism to give you examples of uh, what we've done in the transcriptome project. 
So I have to give you a little bit of introduction to the biology of uh, copper nutrition in Chlamydomonas. Uh, this is a project that we've been working on for about 25 years now. And it uh, arose from my interest in plastocyanin, which is a blue copper protein. Its uh, structure is shown here, and you can see the copper at its active site. And of course, that the copper is what's uh, essential for function of this molecule. It turns out to be the most abundant copper protein in uh, Chlamydomonas, um, and also, uh, for example, in plant leaves, where it constitutes about 50 to 80 percent of the copper content of the cells. Okay, so what happens in a copper uh, deficient culture? You can see these cells are growing phototrophically, meaning on photosynthesis, even though plastocyanin was known to be an essential protein in the electron transfer chain. But what we discovered was that uh, cells have a copper sparing mechanism, and this uh, is a process that many uh, algae um, have, and that is they get rid of the plastocyanin by regulated degradation of the protein, uh, and instead use a soluble C-type cytochrome, a heme protein, to catalyze the exact same reaction. So we were interested in uh, questions related to how does the cell sense the copper, what are the other metabolic adaptations, and so on. So you can see the switch between plastocyanin and cytochrome C6 uh, in the bottom right uh, immunoblot here, where we're doing what we call an algal bloom type of experiment, where we start the cells with a low amount of copper um, in the medium, in this case 20 nanomolar, and then we allow the cells to double and we sample them with every doubling, and then monitor the copper content of uh, the cells, the medium, and of course the protein content. And you can see here the cell switch between two to four times uh, 10 to the six cells per ml between plastocyanin and cytochrome C6. And this switch is mediated by uh, a regulatory factor called CRR1, or copper response regulator. And this is a transcription factor. It's unique to the plant lineage. It's present in all uh, algae and um, uh, uh, land plants. And you can see here that the mutants, CRR1 mutants, are unable to grow on copper deficiency. Okay. This uh, CRR1 transcription factor works by acting on copper response elements that we identified as being associated with the CYC6 gene. Okay. Right. So what I'm going to show you now is the experiments that we did to identify the targets of CRR1 and the genes that are upregulated in copper deficiency. So what we're going to do is compare the transcriptome of the plus copper to the minus copper culture in order to reveal uh, genes that are upregulated in copper deficiency, or we can look at copper deficient wild type cells, or actually in reality the rescued CRR1 mutant directly to the CRR1 mutant, although it grows very poorly, it still does grow, so we're able to isolate uh, cells and RNA from these cultures. So that's one kind of experiment we can do, is just a two-way comparison. Alternatively, we can do the algal bloom experiment that I mentioned to you earlier. We thought maybe this might mimic more what uh, occurs in nature, although all our experiments are done in the laboratory. And in this situation, what we're doing is we collected uh, five samples, starting with the 20 nanomolar copper culture, which we know is not enough to support the synthesis of copper proteins. And we collected uh, samples at 0.5, 1, 2, 4, and 8 times 10 to the 6 cells per ml. And we compare that to the replete situation of 400 nanomolar, which is enough to support the synthesis of uh, copper proteins. So we uh, quality control our preparations uh, of uh, total RNA by RNA blot uh, hybridization. And of course, uh, the bioanalyzer, we find that the hybridization is actually a, a, a much more uh, sensitive probe of degradation. We use a very abundant mRNA, it turns out. And now we know that it's among the uh, top 40 most abundant uh, mRNAs in Chlamydomonas. So we can make sure that we have no degradation before we uh, invest uh, time in sample analysis. And of course, we want to control for the physiology of the culture. In this case, we were looking at the uh, copper deficiency uh, transcriptome. So what we simply do is real-time PCR to look for the sentinel genes that is known CRR1 targets or uh, transporters that we know are involved in copper assimilation. And each point actually comes from um, uh, an independent experiment. So what we're looking at is the upregulation of these genes in minus copper shown in the dark circles relative to uh, plus copper shown in the open circles. Okay. And we, in fact, have... Uh, 
quite a range of uh, uh, fold expression where CYC6 is the most tightly regulated uh, gene, and this is the one that codes for the backup protein to plastocyanin. Okay. So we started off initially using uh, um, NLA3 tags to, uh, to, do these, to do this work, but then uh, Christian Houdenschild at uh, Illumina, I guess over a year and a half ago, persuaded us to use whole transcriptome analysis instead. Although uh, the tag method was designed to be quantitative, I'll show you now that in fact the whole transcriptome analysis, the RNA-seq method is, uh, um, is indeed uh, even more quantitative. Okay, so we're going to be looking at about 500 uh, megabases of sequence from uh, each sample. We use the, uh, the short sequence read, 35 nucleotides, although uh, Illumina is now producing uh, uh, 70 nucleotide sequences. And we've used both single reads as well as uh, pair dens. Okay, we won't go through the protocol here because you've seen it before, but I'll just emphasize two points. Um, the, uh, cDNAs were synthesized by priming with random hexamers, and of course this is important because we want full uh, transcript coverage rather than a three prime bias. And then there's a size selection step uh, for the paired end protocol, uh, it's about 300 uh, base pairs. So what do we do with uh, the sequence data? We're going to align it back uh, to the genome, and we allow two mismatches. This is a uh, uh, this is standard uh, in the field to allow two mismatches. And then um, we're using the, the, uh, the short oligonucleotide alignment uh, program. In the case of uh, well, annotated, well annotated genomes, we can align not only back to the genome but also to transcript models. For organisms like Chlamydomonas where we don't have perfect uh, transcript models, uh, this doesn't turn out to really improve the alignments. But uh, we're able to align an extra 10% of the reads by using recursive trimming. So we take that 35 nucleotide read and then recursively trim it to uh, 34, 33, 32, et cetera. And the value of that is that you can map an additional 10% of the reads because you're able to map things where maybe you have adapter sequence left behind or some poly A tail or some reads that span uh, exon, exon uh, junctions, for example. So after doing this, we're able to map 89% uh, of all the reads back to the genome, and 81% of these map back uniquely. Okay, so about 10% of the reads map to uh, multiple places. For quantitative transcriptomics, of course, we're only going to use the data from the unique hits back to the genome, but uh, for gene model annot uh, annotation, of course, we're going to use all of the reads. Okay, so this is just a summary of uh, the, the data we've uh, processed uh, to date. So uh, we have uh, uh, collaborators, uh, Arthur Grossman's group, Chris Niogi's group, and we don't yet have data from Maria Girardi's group, but that's in the pipeline. So you can see that we have about um, 20 gigabases of, uh, of transcriptome sequence uh, from Chlamydomonas. So given that uh, about 30% of the genome is exons, we're estimating about a 500-fold uh, coverage of the uh, exons through this uh, transcriptome data. And what you're looking at in the plot here is a number of genes that have full uh, coverage uh, of, uh, of the exons. So that's shown in the red graph here. And you can, uh, so this is uh, one lane of uh, Selexa sequencing, two, three, four, et cetera. This is eight, and all the way up to about 61 lanes here. And you can see that we're sort of uh, saturating at about 8,000 genes. And we think that's because, of course, we have a limited set of conditions. We only have experiments from uh, three labs at this point. And uh, both Arthur and uh, my lab's interested in uh, nutrient deficiencies, so we've looked at copper, iron, zinc, sulfur, phosphorus deficiency, and we're all working with photoheterotrophically grown cells, so it's a very limited uh, set of experimental conditions. So we think in order to get 100% coverage of uh, the 15,000 genes or so, we just need to sample uh, additional uh, conditions and maybe develop mental states. Okay. So here's what the data look like. We map them onto uh, the UCSC browser, and this is just uh, a view of a couple of the genes. I chose uh, two different genes that uh, are expressed at uh, uh, different levels. PET-F turns out to be among the most highly expressed uh, genes in Chlamydomonas. It's definitely, I think, in the top 20. And what you're looking at here is uh, the sum of all of the experiments and a count. So what I'm plotting here is uh, counts per million. So every time you, a count means that we saw that nucleotide once. 
and uh, in the bottom here we have uh, a gene involved in starch metabolism and it's expressed at about a hundredfold uh, less in terms of RNA abundance. So that's what it looks like. You'll notice of course that the reads map to exons and naturally we didn't ignore this point because we can use this in the long term for uh, genome annotation. Okay. So the goal then in these studies was to identify differentially expressing genes and I told you we were going to compare the transcriptome of uh, two different conditions. So, but in order to do this, we needed to do some data manipulation. So on the left hand side, what I'm showing you, I think these are um, data from about 12 different uh, experiments and what we've plotted is um, the uh, the frequency with which any particular gene has uh, say 10 counts, 100,000 or 10,000 counts. So on the right hand side you have highly expressed genes and on the left hand side you have less expressed genes. So you can see there's quite some variability and that's because we're looking at the raw data. Because from some experiments you might get 500 megabases of sequence, from other experiments you might get 300 or 700. Um, and so, the, so we needed to do some correction for things like that. So uh, the other issue, of course, is I showed you on the previous uh, figure, we looked at the PEDF gene and that scale was one kilobase, whereas the GWD gene was 11 kilobases. So if we're going to be able uh, to count transcripts, we also need to normalize for length of, uh, of the gene model. So we, uh, so we corrected for length of the gene mo model, by, um, but actually it turned out what we're correcting for is what we call uniquely mappable reads because we only want to look at reads that map uniquely uh, onto the genome. So this means that if we're looking at gene families, some of uh, the, the reads are going to map at uh, multiple places. And of course for quantitation we can't use those reads. So let's say you have a 3 kilobase sequence but only 2.7 of it is, uh, um, can be mapped uniquely, then, the, then we're correcting for that 2.7 kilobases instead of the actual uh, gene length. Okay, so we correct for that. We're correcting for read length as well. Remember I told you we did this recursive trimming down to about 25 nucleotides. So we have to correct for that as well. But the most important correction uh, was a statistical correction to correct for differences in sequencing depth. Because of course you can see quite some variation here in uh, the, uh, the low expressing genes. So um, there were two types of uh, corrections done and one was to correct for zero values, so this was done by a, a probabilistic estimation of what the counts in those uh, uh, reads should be. So this is a situation where you might have in uh, some lanes zero counts and other lanes one or two counts, and then the question is, is the zero really a zero? And so based on the counts that you see in other lanes, one can estimate what that zero really should be. Um, and. Uh, uh, and of course you want to extrapolate your data to infinite uh, uh, sequencing depth. And so we also apl uh, applied uh, censored corrected distribution to the data in order to obtain the graph shown on the right hand side. So this is the corrected expression that we're using for all of the quantitative transcriptomics. And I should point out that these 12 experiments include ex uh, experiments from two different people in my group, so done at different times by different hands, as well as data from my lab as well as Arthur Grossman's lab. So we can get quite uh, reproducible distributions of, uh, of counts for genes in the genome between individuals and also between laboratories. And that I think is going to be important if we want to compare data in the long term uh, between experiments done over a period of time under different conditions. Okay, so we can then get counts for all genes in, um, in the genome and we can look at individual metabolic pathways. In this case I'm showing you the chlorophyll or the tetrapyrrol biosynthetic pathway going from delta amino levulenic acid to heme uh, and biliverdin or to chlorophyll. And what I'm showing you is uh, in parentheses here is the number of counts that we have for each uh, gene in that pathway. So we can look at gene families or, uh, and determine which of uh, two members in the PBG deaminase uh, uh, gene family is perhaps more relevant at least under this growth condition. Uh, you can see in other cases all members of the urogen decarboxylase gene family are about equally uh, expressed. We're looking at counts per million here. Uh, heme oxygenase again is like PBG deaminase where one isoform is clearly the more uh, dominant one. 
In blue are the counts from plus copper, and in red are the counts from minus copper. So of course we can compare the, uh, for all 15,000 genes in the genome, the counts we have for uh, plus versus minus, and then come up with the list of genes. We use a two-fold uh, cutoff. And when we compare the plus copper to the minus copper transcriptome, we saw about 150 genes that were differentially expressed at the level of two-fold cutoff, and it's about half that if we use a five-fold cutoff. In the blue circle here uh, shows you the transcriptome of the mutant, the transcription factor mutant relative to the complemented strain. And of course we get many more, we get about 800 plus uh, genes there and that's because we're looking at a mutant and it's probably in a stress situation. But what we're most interested in is the overlap of those and this should identify for us the, uh, the copper deficiency t uh, genes that are direct targets of the CRR1 transcription factor. So. You know, what are these uh, 58 genes? Here's this pie chart showing you where they fall. Uh, what was really striking to us is that about half of them are involved in uh, some type of redox metabolism. Not all of them are proteins of known function, but they, uh, some of them have annotation, others simply have a PFAM motif uh, that tell you that it's an oxidase. Uh, just about a quarter of them are proteins of unknown function, and my guess would be they'll eventually turn out to be redox proteins as well. We have some transporters, obviously involved in copper. It turns out also iron assimilation. Mm -hmm. And then remember I told you that uh, plastocyanin degradation was a regulated process that was CRR1 dependent, but we've never known what the protease for that is. So we have two candidate uh, proteases that might be the ones that are responsible for degrading plastocyanin. And the purpose of that is to rescue the copper for other copper proteins in the cell. Okay, so here's just a summary of uh, some of the interesting components. I know many individuals in the audience might be interested in anaerobic metabolism in Chlamydomonas. And what I've shown in gray are the genes that are differentially regulated and quite reproducibly so in uh, plus versus minus copper, but are not CRR1 targets. And then in black font are the ones that are CRR1 targets. Okay, so this pathway you can see many components. Uh, these genes had previously been identified in a microarray study from uh, uh, Maria Girardi, Mike Seibert, and Arthur Grossman's groups uh, as being involved in uh, anaerobic metabolism in Chlamydomonas, and we saw many of the same genes upregulated in the copper deficiency cells as well. And this suggests to us some connection between copper metabolism and perhaps the, the signaling pathway that, uh, that, that signals to these genes involved in, uh, uh, in the anaerobic pathways in Chlamydomonas. Most of the other enzymes that we were able to place into pathways, as I told you, turn out to be redox enzymes. Many of them in lipid metabolism, both within the plastid, such as uh, um, acyl ACP uh, desaturase, the FAB2 locus here, uh, monogalactosyl diglyceride specific uh, palmitate delta 7 desaturase, but also various P450s that are extra plastidic that might be involved um, in, uh, uh, in sterile metabolism. We identified another uh, back, potential backup enzyme. Most of the amino oxidases that have been catalyzed are copper amino oxidases, and we found this flavin amino oxidase that was previously uncharacterized, but we hypothesized that it's something that's used as a backup for a copper amino oxidase in the Chlamydomonas genome. Okay. And then, of course, some new components, for example, ferredoxins that accept electrons from photosystem one. Remember, plastocyanin is the donor to photosystem one. We've identified, in particular, FDX5, which is actually several thousand-fold upregulated in, um, in copper deficiency. So we've certainly learned some new things about uh, copper metabolism. And then when we looked at the algal bloom experiment, I'm not going to go through all the data here, but I'll just show you this one last slide. Um, we uh, identified after uh, clustering the data from uh, the 10 samples that were sequenced, the red arrows show you all of the genes that we had previously identified in the plus versus minus, minus uh, copper transcriptome, and the ones with the dots are the ones that are CRR1 targets. So this is one of uh, the clusters, uh, cluster one, that came out of this analysis. So it was very gratifying to see that we identify uh, the same genes. Okay, for those of you who are interested in, uh, sort of, uh, in how quantitative the technique is, we did uh, real-time PCR analysis on 
I think about 50 different uh, uh, genes that we identified and what I've plotted here is a correlation between the RNA-seq data versus real-time PCR, and you can see that we have an R squared of 0.95, which is really very nice. And what's particularly impressive is the dynamic range. So this point here on the extreme right is the CYC6 gene, which you can see is very highly regulated. This is two to the 14-fold uh, uh, regulation, and that pretty much falls right on the line. Okay, so we've looked at uh, uh, samples that are either not regulated, twofold regulated, or in fact very highly regulated, and this also covers a dynamic range of about a thousand in terms of transcript abundance. So it, uh, um, it's uh, indeed uh, RNA seq is a really valuable approach. The other value of um, the RNA seq technology is that besides giving us um, fold changes in gene expression, we can also look at the browser. So this is a, a shot of the CTH1 locus, which, is, which was known to be regulated by copper from a previous study that we had done. And what we're looking at is the track from the plus copper wild type sample to the minus copper wild type sample. And what we saw, of course, was that we had reads in regions of the uh, minus copper experiment that were not present in the plus copper. So in fact, these data can identify different transcript forms that are regulated by copper nutrition. So this is added uh, uh, value with the RNA-seq data. Okay. So in the last few minutes, what I'd like to do is simply uh, tell you about the status of the genome annotation work that we're uh, doing in, uh, in uh, the Pellegrini uh, group. And this is the work of uh, David Casero, who is uh, in the audience and is uh, happy to answer questions at his, uh, at his poster uh, later this evening. Okay. So, of course, when we were analyzing these data, the, it hadn't escaped us that the reads were pretty much map, mapping to exons. And we, when we looked at individual gene models, and there's a couple shown here, we, uh, we noticed that this particular gene model could be extended in both the five prime and three prime directions uh, using the, uh, the short read uh, transcriptome data. In this case, we're looking at the paired end reads, the little rectangles show you the, uh, the ends of the pair. And we could predict that there should be new exons, two new exons at the five prime end, um, and we should be able to extend this model in the three prime direction as well, okay? So remember I told you that uh, the protocol had a size selection step in the, for the paired end, so of course we expect there to be a, uh, a specific uh, distance between the two paired ends. And you can see then that when we're plotting the number of pairs as a, a function of uh, the alignment distance, all of the pairs that um, read sequence within the exons have a very sharp tight distribution at about 130 base pairs. And that makes sense given the length of uh, the read, the length of uh, uh, the, the primers used for amplification, the adapters that is, uh, it, uh, it matches perfectly. Of course, we also have these longer distances and what they correspond to are um, uh, paired end reads that of course span introns. So we're able to use these through exon pairs in order to um, predict where the introns should be within the reads. So what I'm showing you on the right hand side here are three examples of uh, gene models that we've predicted shown in black relative to the ones on uh, the JGI browser. And you can see when you do the comparison that in fact we're doing very well with just a ver the first iteration of, uh, of the protocol. When you look at it more closely, you'll see that some of our models are longer than uh, the JGI models. And that is because, of course, these are EST-based. Uh, and in that case, you're looking at only a few, mole uh, a few uh, molecules. And pro it's likely, remember, this is the log scale on uh, the y-axis. So it's likely that we have a short number, a small number of transcripts, maybe a few percent, that uh, have a different three prime end. And uh, that's why our models look a bit longer. Okay. So we have a uh, set of go what we call gold standard models. These are manually curated models. Stephen Karpowitz in my group did that, and uh, he presented his poster yesterday. We have 187 models that we know have been uh, uh, very uh, carefully uh, uh, developed from individual projects in uh, individual laboratories. And they, uh, we picked them 
based uh, also to represent a diversity of transcript abundance. So one of the models, in fact, has uh, no EST coverage, and in fact, even in our uh, even with 20 gigabases of sequence, we haven't yet penetrated that model. So we've picked genes like that. And we've also, of course, picked the abundant transcripts like the LHCs and so on. So we asked the question, how many of the models that we generate, uh, how well do they overlap with this gold standard? So in this first pass, about half of our models had an overlap score of 0 0.8. And you can see that here. And that looks pretty good. However, of course, in the last figure, I showed you some of the, some of the good looking uh, uh, overlaps. But we also have some that look like this. And what I've circled here uh, uh, for you are, um, are areas where we're not able to actually come up with uh, the correct uh, intron exon junctions. And the reason for this is that we have substantial read within the introns here. Okay. So uh, uh, David and Matteo have developed a new pipeline. Uh, and this is just something that we, they've only been working on in the last couple of weeks, so we're not able to give you the latest uh, uh, results here. But we start with our coverage, and we're using the paired end reads here. You can see that in blue, simply to uh, define where a single locus might be. So the dashed line shows you the limits of the paired end reads. Okay. And then we can extend the boundary by, uh, by looking at uh, the, the cumulative uh, read track here. So now we have a single locus window, and they apply a segmentation analysis to generate uh, pseudo transcripts. And it turns out that the segmentation analysis really takes care of the problem that we're having with reads within the intron. And what we hope to then apply is uh, splicing evidence. So we've used, uh, uh, in cases where we're able to map across the introns, we're able to use that as a database to come up with uh, consensus donor and acceptor splice sites. We hope to put that into the pseudo transcripts to generate transcript models, which can be translated to give us the protein coding gene models. OK, so just to uh, conclude, what I've uh, told, shown you today is that the RNA-seq for chlamydomonas transcriptomics correlates really nicely with the real-time PCR. The data are reproducible both between labs and, uh, uh, but what I didn't show you was that there are differences with, uh, between individual strains. Okay. And, uh, we're able to penetrate all, almost all uh, expressed genes. In the case of uh, the biology that I showed you with respect to copper nutrition, one of the take-home messages is that uh, there's clearly uh, an un a previously unknown connection between copper nutrition and various types of redox metabolism. Okay. What we'd like to do in the future is increase the number of conditions, not only look at the mineral nutrients, but CO2 light, nitrogen, cell cycles, zygote program, cell wall biosynthesis. These are all conditions that collaborators have talked to us about. We'd like to incorporate mutants into the analysis so that we can come up with, uh, uh, with, with with transcription factor dependent pathways of uh, gene regulation. And we're also working on identifying upstream regulatory sequences once we have the, uh, in, in, in our case, the CRR1 set of, uh, of, uh, of target genes. Okay. Uh, we're, in the long term, hope to develop an expression profile for each locus uh, in the genome so that we can, so anybody can go in and look at his or her favorite gene of interest and ask the question, under what condition is it expressed? And that might help uh, studies of reverse genetics to figure out under what condition do you want to test a phenotype. And um, for the uh, gene model annotation, I've shown you that uh, we think we can get 100% coverage of uh, the entire genome once we expand the number of uh, uh, conditions. Up to now, we can define exon connectivity and the limits of a locus with uh, the paired end reads. We, uh, we hope to use the longer reads, the 70 uh, nucleotides and greater, in order to span the exon-exon junctions. And I think this is going to help uh, uh, gene model building quite uh, substantially. And uh, strand-specific sequencing, which uh, Joe Ecker mentioned to you uh, yesterday, that will also help us to figure out whether some of the reads we're seeing in introns actually come from uh, the other strand. And so David will apply his advanced annotation pipeline. And then we hope to test those models experimentally uh, to d determine whether uh, we got them right. <laughs>